So the disease process is atherosclerosis. An atheroma develops within the arterial system. And in particular, atheroma can accumulate within the coronary arteries, the arteries which supply the myocardium itself with blood. There can be coronary arterial atherosclerosis with the deposition of atheromatous plaques within the coronary arterial system. And this causes coronary arterial disease. There is coronary arterial atherosclerosis. This is the prime pathology, atheroma in the coronary arteries. But how does this present clinically? Well, basically, there are two forms of presentation as a result of coronary arterial atherosclerosis. Now, if the plaques are stable, if the roofs of the plaques are stable, then we're going to get chronic stable angina if the atheromatous plaques are big enough to cause a partial occlusion of the arterial lumen, of the coronary arterial lumen. So there can be chronic stable angina, sometimes called angina of effort. This will give rise to the pain called angina pectoris, or angina of effort. So what happens here is whenever the metabolic demand of the myocardium exceeds the ability of the coronary arterial system to deliver blood and therefore oxygen to the metabolizing myocardium, there's going to be an imbalance between the oxygen demand of the myocardium and the oxygen supply of the myocardium. So we're going to get the features of angina pectoris whenever the metabolic demand of the myocardium exceeds the ability of the blood in the partially occluded coronary arteries to deliver oxygen to that metabolizing myocardial tissue. And we can get chronic stable angina. And this is chronic. Patients can have this for, for years or even decades. It can be quite a stable condition. And the pain is called angina pectoris. And it's fairly typical. It comes on with effort. So if the patient's walking or going upstairs or trying to perform some aerobic activity, they can get the pain because that's going to increase the metabolic demand of their myocardium. Now, as the metabolic demand of the myocardium increases and the oxygen supply is insufficient, then the metabolism in the myocardium can change from being aerobic to being anaerobic. And as you probably know, if there's anaerobic metabolism, that can result in the production of lactic acid. And we believe it's the lactic acid that causes the pain associated with chronic stable angina of effort. But then when the patient rests and the metabolic demand of the myocardium is reduced, even though the blood supply is limited, it can catch up, it can pay back the oxygen debt of the myocardium and the pain passes off. But the pain has typical myocardial distribution. So very often it's a central, heavy, crushing type of chest pain. It can radiate into the left shoulder, even into the left arm. Sometimes, less commonly, it can radiate to the right side. It can radiate up into the neck and the jaw, and it can radiate down into the epigastric area. It's typical myocardial distribution pain, but it's associated with effort and the pathology is stable atheromatous plaques. It is just the occlusion of the blood supply resulting in degrees of myocardial ischemia, the partial occlusion of the blood supply. There is not a complete occlusion of the blood supply, it's partial. Now, the converse of that is acute coronary syndrome. So coronary arterial atherosclerosis can give rise to chronic stable angina, or it can give rise to ACS, the acute coronary syndrome. And this is pretty well what it says. It's a coronary syndrome with an acute presentation. It's an acute coronary syndrome. And we recognize this by the history presentation examination. So typically the patient will be at rest, maybe even asleep and might be woken up by the pain. Sometimes the patient can be undergoing some sort of physical activity at the time, but the pain can come on at any time. And the pain in acute coronary syndrome is not relieved by rest, like the pain in chronic stable angina is. Because what's happening in acute coronary syndrome is a stable plaque 
has become destabilized. The roof of the plaque is disrupted, it might be fissured or ulcerated, and components of the thrombogenic core of the plaque have come into contact with the platelets and started some sort of thrombus formation. So in acute coronary syndrome, virtually all cases of acute coronary syndrome are caused by disruption, by an instability in a previously stable atheromatous plaque, resulting in a degree of intravascular, intraarterial thrombus formation. The disease process is called thrombosis. And this means a plaque or an area of artery which is already partly occluded by a plaque, it's already partly occluded, but then if there's thrombus formation inside, that can block off the rest of the lumen. And the rest of the lumen can be completely blocked off, or you can just get an increasing degree of blockage in the rest of the lumen. So history and presentation, typical myocardial presentation is normal with the pain, the crushing chest pain. The patients say it's like having concrete slabs on their chest or bore constrictor squeezing them. It's a horrible, heavy sort of pain. Very often going to the left side, sometimes down the left arm, sometimes going to the right, going up into the neck and the jaw possibly, sometimes going down into the epigastric area. This is typical myocardial pain and it's terrifying. These patients are very frightened. So severe pain, anxiety, tachycardia very often, sweaty, grey pallor. The patients look pretty bad because of the pallor and the greyness due to the sympathetically induced vasoconstriction. These patients look very ill. They indeed look like their lives are in danger, which of course they are. And the patients feel like their lives are in danger. They've got an acute coronary syndrome with this acute presentation. And of course, as healthcare professionals, this is something we must always take completely seriously. This is a medical emergency. And we do a 12 lead ECG, and we'll also take blood for cardiac markers, particularly the troponins. So the presentation we can do straight away, the 12 lead ECG will only take a few minutes, so they should be done immediately. Now, the blood results for the troponins won't be back for an hour or two, so we can't wait for that. We have to act clinically based on the typical presentation of acute coronary syndrome and the 12 lead ECG. And there are three presentations of acute coronary syndrome. Well, actually, acute coronary syndrome is a continuum, but we tend to divide it into three presentations. Now, the first one the first presentation of acute coronary syndrome is unstable angina. Unstable angina. So what's happening here is there is a degree of thrombosis usually caused by platelet aggregation causing white thrombus, but this does not completely occlude the coronary artery. So there is some thrombus formation on a destabilized atheromatous plaque but not enough to completely block off the arterial lumen. It's just increasing the degree of blockage. And there can also be some distal embolization of platelet plugs going down the arterial system as well. So what you have in unstable angina is a degree of increased coronary arterial occlusion. It's been acutely increased, but it's not enough to block it off. The patient gets the same pain, but they don't get the ST elevation that we're going to see about in a minute. And as well as that, with acute coronary syndrome presenting as unstable angina, there is not any release of cardiac markers. So the idea here is there's an increased occlusion of the coronary arterial vessel that's greatly reducing the blood supply to the myocardium, but it's not enough to actually cause necrosis of the myocardium. So you don't get the troponins. So sometimes this is called troponin negative acute coronary syndrome or unstable angina. And although this is something we have to take very seriously, it's the least serious presentation of the acute coronary syndrome. It's important because the patient's suffering. It's important because it's an indicator of a destabilized coronary atheromatous plaque. And it's important because it can progress on to the next stage. This one 
can progress on to the next stage. It's a continuum. And if we don't intervene at this stage, it can progress on to this. And this stands for non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. So unstable angina can progress on to a non-STEMI. And this is where you have a myocardial infarction. There'll be all the clinical features of the acute coronary syndrome, with the pain, the distress, the sweating, the, um, the anxiety. But as it says, there is no ST elevation. We won't get the ST elevation. Now, in non-STEMIs, sometimes you don't get ST changes. Sometimes you get ST depression, indicating ischemic changes. But you don't get the ST elevation, and you don't get the left bundle branch block either. But it is an MI. It is a myocardial infarction. Part of the myocardium does necrose, does die, and when the troponin results come back, it'll be troponin positive. And if you look for other cardiac markers, like creating kinase, then they can be elevated as well. So that can progress onto that. Non-STEMI can also progress onto STEMI, ST elevation myocardial infarction, where we do have the ST elevation. And a STEMI is defined as the acute coronary syndrome, clinical features, with ST elevation or new left bundle branch block on the ECG, and it will be positive for cardiac markers as well, such as creating kinase and troponins. Now, we've said that can progress onto that and that can progress onto that, that's true, but patients can also present at this stage or can present at this stage. So a previously healthy patient can present with an acute ST elevation, myocardial infarction. And very often, the patients I've talked to who've had this condition can be surprised by it. They say, well, you know, I was previously quite fit. You know, why have I had a heart attack all of a sudden? You know, I was, last week I was cycling and playing squash. And the thing is that a previously non-significant atheromatous plaque that was not bad enough to cause any sort of chronic stable angina it wasn't bad enough to cause this, but the plaque was there and the plaque has destabilized and ruptured, exposing the thrombogenic core of the plaque to the blood, resulting in acute thrombus formation. So typically we can say that troponin negative acute coronary syndrome and non-STEMI are caused by partial occlusion, very often by white thrombus, which is caused by platelet aggregation and STEMI, where you get the complete blockage, is caused by red thrombus formation, which will completely occlude a length of the coronary arterial system. Now, of course, any acute coronary syndrome, we need to treat that as an emergency. And you may choose to use the A, B, C, D, E approach. A stands for access, these patients need IV access. A also stands for aspirin and chlorpidogrel, 300 milligrams of aspirin is a stat dose to chew, 300 milligrams of uh, chlorpidogrel, unless of course they're going for percutaneous coronary intervention, in which case you want to give 600 milligrams of chlorpidogrel. So A for access, IV access, A for aspirin, B is the patients will probably be put on beta blockers if they're hemodynamically stable enough for that, especially if there's an ST elevation myocardial infarction. So access, aspirin, probable beta blockers. C stands for coronary arterial vasodilators. So this is probably going to be your quick acting sublingual glycerine trinitrate that can dilate the coronary arterial system and also reduce afterload, often resulting in reduction in the myocardial pain. So access, aspirin and chlorpidogrel, beta blockers, coronary arterial vasodilators. What do you think the D is going to be for? D is for diamorphine, 2.5 to 5 milligrams of diamorphine, but you can use morphine sulfate as well, 5 to 10 milligrams of morphine sulfate, and you want to give metoclopramide as well, 
maybe 10 milligrams to stop the patient from being sick. You can leave it there, A, B, C, D, E, A, A, B, C, D, or you can add E if you want. And the reason I'm adding E is for years and years and years, as soon as a patient came into coronary care, we'd put the oxygen on them. Of course, we want to maximise the oxygenation of the myocardium. But new research and new guidelines say that we should only give the patient additional oxygen if they are hypoxemic. So if their SATs are 94% or less, we probably want to give oxygen. If the SATs are higher than 94%, we don't give oxygen. And the thinking here seems to be that oxygen will increase the amount of free radical formations in the myocardium, increasing myocardial necrosis. So we'll look more in this video later on about the treatment of acute coronary syndrome, but that's a quick run through. So any case of acute coronary syndrome, whether it's the unstable angina, the, the non-STEMI or the STEMI, we want to think about managing as an acute coronary syndrome, because that's what all these things are. But if it's a STEMI, then we need to go on to immediate revascularization therapy. Now, the debate as to which is most effective, whether it's thrombolysis or percutaneous coronary intervention, is over. PCI is by far the best. There's big epidemiological studies demonstrate PCI is the best option. But it's got to be quick. So if thrombolysis was available immediately and PCI was not available for a couple of hours, then you're probably better going with the thrombolysis. Get that clot dissolved, reperfuse the coronary artery. If it's available, take this patient for immediate PCI because we need to get rid of that blood clot. We need to get the blood back to the myocardium as quickly as we can and that will stop it dying. Time here is of the essence because the saying in coronary care is time is muscle. We need to get these coronary arteries reperfused and we're going to do that with PCI if at all possible or if there's no PCI available or PCI is going to take too long then we'll go for the thrombolysis option. So the problem is the coronary arterial atherosclerosis. This is the bad guy. This is the problem. Chronic presentation, acute presentation, acute presentation, the spectrum of severity, which is the acute coronary syndrome, managing the acute coronary syndrome, or immediate reperfusion or PC with PCI or thrombolysis if we're dealing with a STEMI, or if we have the clinical features with troponins with a new bundle, left bundle branch block. Of course, if you have a STEMI, you haven't got time to wait for the troponins to come back. If you've got the clinical features with the ST elevation or a new left bundle branch block, we carry on to coronary arterial reperfusion emergency treatments.